What is up, everyone? This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read some stuff this week. Again, we're covering Spielberg, part two of our series. Uh, a little title you might be aware of, Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies, actually. I love it a lot as well. I will go ahead and out myself at the top of the show. I and my fiance, we bought a Jurassic Park Jeep Wrangler this year. <laughs> and so uh, Jurassic Park has been on my mind. Uh, why? <laughs> it's been such an amazing puzzle because what I'm left with is is the sense that and when you're talking about adaptation, material working inside that format, there's not a better example almost than looking at Jurassic Park. Because what the novel is and what the novel does is exquisite for a novel. Uh, and it is sharply about corporatism, greed, big, gr big greedy corporate uh, interest getting involved with science and, and, and things that they just don't that don't mesh with just the numbers game of profit and gain. Yeah. And the Hammond character becomes central to it all. In the book, the Hammond character is a hard line. He wins. He wins, 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 and he doesn't care. Very, very different person in the, in the, in the film. Because I think what Spielberg came to is that, yes, we can talk about corporate greed. We can talk about big donor interests and oversight with science. But what are we going to say? How are we going to say this through a lens that that audiences can relate to? And I think this is really where the genius comes in. Spielberg, I think, in the scripting of this, I mean, and he's intrinsically involved in the genesis of the film. Uh, he's friends with Michael Crichton, as we covered. Yeah. Uh, and he they had already bought the rights to it. Yeah. And so they're like, you have to do this. So he's like we not said, precious yeah. with this material. I think that he gets in and is really able to, with the screenwriters, to hash out what about the book is going to translate and then what do we need to put around it to support it? Um, I think the genius comes in here, uh, opening it up and focusing in on Grant in the book. Grant is this, is, 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 is he likes kids in the movie. He's afraid of kids. The whole movie becomes about do Ellie and Grant want to be parents. And so if you make that shift, if you make that shift, everything shifts around it. And I think that it bears out and ripples throughout the entire thing. And it's such a smart decision uh, because I think that's where audiences really can engage and connect. The book is not talking about the relationship between <laughs> parents and, and, and right. their children, really. The film is. Because the film decided it needed to be about the responsibility that comes with creation. That's a mm -hmm. that's a perfect way to widen the lens. And so you mm -hmm. can talk about the larger version there, God versus the devil, right there with Hammond and Malcolm, or you can talk about the 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 dirt and roots of it, you and me, mom and dad, Grant and <laughs> Ellie. Yeah, that's awesome. And obviously audiences also related to it because this is, as we teased takes the lead for the highest grossing film of all time. Ba -ba! <laughs> so this is the third time his film is the highest grossing film ever. God, and man. <laughs> he crushes it. The thing was with the, with the making of this, Time Warner had wanted Spielberg because they had cash. So Universal had to sweeten the deal to get him over. To, Which means they had to, the leverage. <laughs> they had the, it's all about the leverage. About the leverage. <laughs> so the thing that they put in his contract, they said Spielberg could serve as creative consultant on any theme park attractions related to his film and any film he directed would Ooh. stay at universal. So the theme park consulting perk was 2% of all park ticket revenue, as well as park concession revenue, a portion of it in perpetuity. So that's still holding. So his annual payout for doing nothing for these theme parks of universal exceeds 50 million every year. Gosh. What a great, better thing than just being like, oh, well, I'll work for a different company for more money now. Yeah. That's really. why you got to look at them contracts. <laughs> yeah, really. But that's how it affected him personally <laughs> and how he's the highest and all throughout the universe. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that is how he excelled from, <laughs> from this small decision to say, I want to I wanna do this. Um, but like we said oh before, the, the reason he jumped into it was because he they said okay well we'll help you with Schindler's List after right. so he was actually it's amazing working the, on them the you had mentioned in the previous it. one yeah 
<laughs> so, you know, a, a hurricane to completely disrupts Jurassic Park's filming. So they had, had planned a week of on the ground shooting in Kauai that they totally had to cancel and replan and cut scenes and remove over. So Jurassic Park blows up in the middle of its production. And meanwhile, he's starting to prep uh, Schindler's List and he's going to edit Jurassic Park while he is shooting Schindler's List. I kid you not. Crazy. This is 1993. And they both come out then, yeah. Schindler's uh, List, based on a true story book called Schindler's Ark. He used the profits of it to set up the Shoah Foundation, which is a nonprofit that archives filmed testimony of Holocaust survivors. Oh my gosh. And I believe he's won several awards for their efforts. But 1994, a lot of people thought, okay, well, he's either done or is taking a very long break because he said, I'm not going to do anything after this. Like this, it really, Schindler's List took a toll on him. I mean, Schindler's List on its own would be emotionally rocking. I could not imagine what you would have left in the tanks after coming home shooting that. Yeah. But imagine that that was in the middle of a sprint and you shot something just as complex and crazy on a wildly different scale that takes totally different sensibilities, 100%, 180 degrees, and you walk from one set into the other. Right. From one recording studio to one editing bay. And you're on set doing now, you're doing the one and you're crying. And it's great. It's, it's, and you just like, and you have to gulp it. And, okay, cut. And you go into a room. Mm -hmm. Steven... So we are testing the new, uh, we're testing the new T-Rex roar, but we're not sure if it's deep enough. Does the bass on the, you know, like that's, that's the kind of calls. Yeah. And he's dealing with Schindler's List. I just, I cannot overstate. And what I think about, I mean, anytime I think about this, I think about making uh, Gone with the Wind <laughs> and the Wizard of Oz coming out the same year. And the right. same person making them, <laughs> which we don't think about. And it feels, yeah. and I'm like, as I'm saying that's it right crazy. now, I'm like, I'm, am I wrong about this? And I don't think I am because that's how wild it is that the same person made two crazy movies in the same year. That's, that's the Spielberg way as well, for sure. So he's taking this break and ends up though, after a couple of years building this studio, now we know it as DreamWorks with Jeffrey Katzenberg and David Geffen. That's the SKG that shows up in the, uh, mm, the bottom where it says DreamWorks yeah. SKG. It stands for Spielberg, Katzenberg, Geffen. Ah. Katzenberg was in charge of the Disney Renaissance, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King. He was yeah. the head of Disney for all that stuff. Jeez. And then Geffen created Asylum Records, Geffen Records, most modern rock pop bands that you know he was the record <laughs> label for. So all of them making a production company the logo music for <laughs> DreamWorks. I just thought this was cool. <laughs> Please. You guessed it. John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> that, dun, dun, dun. I can't even do it, but the. Do, it, do, 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 yeah, yeah. That's John. That's John. That's old. That's old Johnny Williams coming back in. <laughs> um, so now he's off his break. 1996, he directs The Lost World, which is a loose adaptation you know more about it than i do of book two yeah it is a bit looser and it's regarded as not quite as not as tight i really am a defender of the movie i think it's not i, I think it's yes it's not as as tight as jurassic park is but it is still and if you want to look at what maybe what has happened to this franchise over the last few years if you look at why this franchise exists and what is happening in the second one here this movie is all about familial relationship it's not about nothing but that mm -hmm. um, malcolm now you know is is back and he's between relationships alive. and he, you know he's alive yeah which is a total of 180 is it's inspired I, I think we went over in the uh, michael crichton epi episode is that uh you know the the film was so in, is so crazy and, and had such life to it that it inspired michael crichton to bring the character back from the dead who had died <laughs> in the novel and now he's the star he really you know michael crichton himself you know had enough wherewithal to go he, well, that's the voice really of what i want to say what michael crichton mm -hmm. had to say lies right in uh, the the uh, Malcolm character. Without that character, there's no more Jurassic yeah. Park, especially for Michael Crichton. So Michael Crichton writes the next book. You know the other characters, which were the really the focal point of the movie, nowhere to be seen. It's all about Malcolm. And now his. Well, and I wanted to I wanted life. to bring yeah, up because yeah, yeah. we had uh, talked about, and I forgot to mention this when we talked about Sherlock Holmes and the fact that. Arthur Conan Doyle brought Sherlock Holmes back by popular demand after he oh, threw him yeah. off the waterfall. So 
Michael Crichton is said in an interview, he got the idea from Sherlock Holmes where he's like, well, if he can bring somebody back that people liked, well, I can yes. do that for my thing. Yes. So there's actually <laughs> Arthur Conan Doyle before he wrote Sherlock Holmes was writing these novels and things. And his 1912 novel is about a world where prehistoric animals have survived this island that they find. It's called that the name of that book is called The Lost World. So he mm -hmm. even titled <laughs> Michael Crichton titled the book as an homage to Arthur Conan Doyle and the idea of bringing somebody back. So he yes. wholeheartedly embraced that and adapted his thing. Look, it's on else, its face is acknowledging it, which yeah. you, know, you hardly know. You know, nobody knows. It. I had no <laughs> idea. Like yeah. it's incredible, actually. So yeah, I mean, I, so what well, was the second biggest film of 1997? Thank God I was there. <laughs> uh, Second biggest, so Titanic beat it, which I was became, there too. <laughs> then became the new record holder, which beat out Jurassic Park one. But he would have had a fourth highest grossing everything away. Again, we have these ebbs and flows of big epic things and more historical, a la Schindler's List or personal kind of things. So Amistad comes out in ninety seven, which yes. is based on the book Mutiny on the Amistad, which is about the eighteen thirty nine slave ship. I just thought the, the way that he found out about this. So there's this gal, Debbie Allen, who's more known as a dancer, choreographer, who had found this book and had wanted this to be a project and ended up getting 10 minutes with him because he's hard to get to. They ended up talking for an hour and a half and she was just like, oh, he got it. And he's like, you know, this is going to be hard to do. They want it to be a musical like people didn't get. But Spielberg got it. You know, she was like, once yeah. I saw that he made Schindler's List, I knew that he could do things like this. Right. And so this was the first directed work of his to be under the DreamWorks Pictures oh, wow. label. Super huge when it came out. The very next year, another historical epic piece, Saving Private Ryan, which the writer of that got from the book D-Day by Stephen Ambrose. And it's based on the real story of the Nyland brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, but this in terms of war movies, my God, influenced combat violence. Yes. How it's presented yeah. filmically, Black Hawk Down, Enemy at the Gates, video games, the Medal of Honor series, Call of Duty, like they all have the landing of D-Day. Yeah, the visual style of that film has permeated and lasted in our lexicon. It really has uh, just a staying power that mm -hmm. I think goes beyond the just even the film itself. It just is part of the language of those images. Mm -hmm. It just is intrinsic to it now. Yeah. So now we move on to the 2000s and beyond, kind of the weirder years, starting with a film project from a friend of his, Stanley Kubrick. AI, which uh, was based on a 1969 short story. And Spielberg tried very hard, I think, and which is why he is not, it's not a, a well-known or well-regarded one, because he was trying to, I think, put together Kubrick's vision yeah. with sort of a Spielberg lens. He was trying to do it justice in a different... Well, uh, Kubrick had been developing this for years. He had started this in the 80s. And for the longest time, didn't think that the film could be made because of, I mean, number one, it's technically advanced just in what you're going to be doing with it. But the Teddy character in particular, they didn't know how they were going to pull that off. And so it kind of bummed around and just was developing for years and years and years. And we got into the 90s and Kubrick is on record himself saying that the sensibilities of what this story is, is really a story that's built for somebody like Steven Spielberg, not me. Mm. So this is uh, an interesting place because it's the year 2001, and he has backed out of doing an all-kids movie, Harry Potter, because he uh -huh. said he wasn't ready to take on that. And there's been a couple of things that he's quoted as saying either like, oh, well, not because it was this massive franchise, but because he knew, oh, this is going to be so big, like there is no challenge to it. And he wanted to do it perhaps right. animated or like it has to be something that hits him in a way that he can commit two or right. three years to. And if it's and not, his, it's not the thing, right. it's his thing, but it's just interesting that he, he didn't, he was semi involved for several months <laughs> in the development of it and then didn't do it and did AI. Looking at AI now at, with an adult eye, while his movies touch me and they're some of my favorite movies of all time, the, this one makes me cry and on a, on a deep, deep sad level that his other films just do not reach i think this film is injected with the lost confusion of a child trying to understand their reason for being here or why that their relationship that should be there isn't there 
he's he's done it beautifully and i think that this i think this film is underrated and i stick up for it and i think i think over time we're going to be thinking about it as maybe one of his best and maybe that's why he didn't do harry potter because he he wasn't feeling (laughs) we'd have a very different harry potter if he took those feelings (laughs) and he was he he had a good relationship with with kubrick i think he was really Mm -hmm. really rocked by the death of kubrick they were friends like this we talk about these people as artists and you know idols and all that kind of you know like we're (sighs) these people knew each other for real yeah so we have to take a moment and think about that that uh, this person disappeared off the face of the earth and his friend was left with the baggage of this project that he said you'd be better for. Yeah. So now that he has completed this more personal work, he's kind of doing a bunch of different, what seems to me like random stuff in the, in the two thousands and on. Yeah. Um, minority. Yeah. Report, I mean, yeah. yeah. Minority. He goes on that two on that cruise ramp. <laughs> minority report. I mean, we're in the wake of nine yeah. 11 right here. Minority oh, report yeah. and uh, war, of the war of the worlds come out. Right up on each other. Yeah. I think 2002 and, and 2005. We're in yeah. the wake of 9-11. I think that's heavy on his mind. I think that's clear in War of the Worlds. I think <laughs> everybody is wondering what we're supposed to do with it. In the middle of that, he does, guess what? Catch me if you can. Catch me if you can. Get ba- another intensely emotional film. Mm-hmm. It's a quiet, dramatic film in a, in a lot of ways. All of and those <laughs> based on books, based on <laughs> something that he's- Bye bye him, bye bye him, bye bye him. God, I mean, is it really like- God, it's got to be seven out of ten. Yeah, <laughs> adaptations. Least, yeah, uh, and then 2005, same year as War of the Worlds, Munich, based on the 1984 book Vengeance, another historical piece. Right. One of his more controversial ones because the book, some people say, was either somewhat fictionalized or like the actual people involved were not approached to consult. So it's kind of this. Now we see these more like, oh well, people accept it because it's a a semi-biographical thing like right. did any of that really happen that way well they didn't ask anybody that was even in it so some of that stuff is contentious but uh 2006 rolls around he says he would direct a scientifically accurate film about a group of explorers who travel through a wormhole to another dimension and there was a treatment by this guy kip thorne who's a theoretical physicist there Jonathan Nolan met with him about turning it yes. into a screenplay. So Spielberg later abandoned it and it became interstellar many yes. years later. But this started in 2006 with Spielberg where he's, yeah, I he read that declared uh, years that. ago. I feel nobody knows that. I would say in actually incredible <laughs> to mm-hmm. hear the, how long that, mo- that movie has had really been kicking around. Yeah. And then 2007 kingdom of the crystal skull comes out. He likes it, defends it, but most people are like, well, that's, here, here comes the really, is Spielberg lost his touch? What in the world is he mm. doing? And then he explores some more. Tintin with Peter Jackson comes out based on the comics. Right. 2011 War Horse also comes out based on a novel adapted from a hit play before that. And then Lincoln based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book Team of Rivals in 2012. Bridge of Spies follows. So it seems like he's really doing these historical pieces, like he's not in the family. In the post. Father. Yeah, so, yeah. gosh. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, the 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 post was filmed and edited as we move on. So he also had the BFG, which I guess was his only kind of childlike oh, thing. Rattling him off, though. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, yeah. it's in, we got to take note. You know, I mean, he's really doing them one after another. If you judge one on its own, I don't know what they say. Looking at it as a whole, it's interesting. He seems to really be dipping his hands into some new new waters. Here. New things. That's all. Uh, that's the all interesting thing is yeah. like, yeah, yeah. I was like, did audiences go? Not all the time, but he, <laughs> most of you know they, enough to get the next one done. Or but you, I think you've heard of. He's these. increasingly feeling that the that the industry is changing, and he's mm-hmm. feeling some of that brunt too. Mm-hmm. I know by the time that Lincoln comes out, he's talking about. Uh, even at his stature, like wondering positioning of where this film is going to live. Is this going to be like an HBO film, you know, <laughs> right. like that kind of even. Yeah. And that's years and years ago at this point, which now we would see is kind of commonplace. But he's, you know, that he's already feeling the effects of, of the coming theatrical, tide that is yeah. the digital streaming and theatrical crisis that we're now living in. He was feeling that 10 years ago. <laughs> right. So I wanted to bring up because somebody had asked about it on Instagram, the Film Ready Player One is the yes. next one that comes out. But I just you had mentioned the post that was filmed, edited, and released during the post production of Ready Player One. So that's oh my how, that's how much he's doing 
on multiple projects. He completed oh the entirety of a film just on the post production. That's when, well, that's you know. interesting because the the Ready Player One is a is a movie of two movies because there's a live action element mm-hmm. to it, and then there's a large, you know, large, largely the film is yeah. uh, a three D film that takes place inside the game world. Yeah. So the physical production of that shoot of Ready Player One, an incredibly contained small shoot in in, in relative terms of what you think of the scale of that movie mm-hmm. and a Steven Spielberg production. Well, when you actually put bones to nuts out on the on the pavement, it's kind of a small thing. And it really is all taking place in the computer. That explains a here. massively long post-production <laughs> yeah. process wherein you can do a whole live action film yeah, and, so would, and release it and win some Oscars before the other. Films. <laughs> he said it was the, the most challenging film since saving private Ryan due to all those VFX. Wow. I believe it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I, I saw, I saw him uh, using the soft, like the avatar, you know, method of the, the actors mo capping out on a soundstage and he just right. looks like a kid. He's just got his little <laughs> monitor and like, Oh, look, he's there in like, they're in black suits, but look there. He, he's a demon. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's just playing. You look, you know, he still looks like that kid in the behind the scenes photos for you and his, his $500 war movie. Yeah. Uh, you know, just kind of playing around. What will this look like? Well, from this angle, does that work? Oh, that's fun. Can you do that again? Do that again. Oh, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> he's, it's, it's amazing to see this 70 year old just like, <laughs> <laughs> bounce actually curious yeah yeah the, the it was of course based on this book by ernest klein the rights were bought by warner brothers a year before the book came out kind of like with jurassic park and whatnot where like this thing came out mm-hmm. in 2010 but they had already decided we want this to turn it into yeah. something so this is eight years in the making the rights became easier with Spielberg's reputation like with roger rabbit where he's got the keys to the kingdom so he can ask Gosh. and and leverage to get he's got the leverage (laughs) to get all the all the random references from the 70s 80s and 90s it took several years to procure all of the different things that they wanted that the book has or that he changed to make into a different reference so for example just Mm -hmm. some some notable ones blade runner was off limits only because Uh blade runner 2049 was in production and they Uh couldn't use that property so he switched it to the shining which honors his friend stanley kubrick like we talked about yes exactly if you wanted if you didn't know that they were friends and didn't think they were <laughs> friends the, the the fact that that you know if you if you're familiar with ready player one the shining is not what in takes book, place yeah. in yeah exactly so that that is the obvious it's not just because he thought it was a sweet movie it's like he you know like he what's is also, a, yeah what's also interesting in terms, in terms of the collaboration the doctor sleep film the production was going on at the same time and they used uh, some of the cgi elements to help recreate the hotel for that film. oh incredible <laughs> so i love that i love and, and, and it's so rare that you see productions actually talk being able to talk and share with each other so that makes it and that actually makes it also why would both be beautiful cgi recreations of the overlook hotel <laughs> what are the chances <laughs> that two productions would need that well they did so there you go in the same year yeah god what kind of dice were through was like okay we got 2018 and uh overlook <laughs> yeah um so they said they got about 80% of the material that they wanted. A fascinating one that they could not get was Close Encounters from Columbia. <laughs> they wanted to use oh, elements of that and they couldn't. That's so sad. That's like, give it to him. It's like one of his like most personal ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing was, it, it probably wouldn't have even mattered because Spielberg opted to remove a lot of the references that Klein yeah. made from the books to his film because, and that we had mentioned this in the first episode of this series, where due to the criticism of 1941, which he was lampooning Jaws and Duel and his other stuff, and he was too big for his britches, he was like, I don't want to do that again. Right. So he didn't want to put an Ernest Klein, who wrote the book, fought to have the DeLorean in there. Because he's like, well, you produced it, but you didn't direct it. And then the T-Rex from Jurassic Park is so classic. He had to have it in there. But uh, Klein said he has no idea. Because the the reason we're talking about it more than anything else is that the Ready Player Two, the sequel book, came out at the end of November of this year. Yeah, hot, hot, fre- hot and fresh. I've got a friend that's in the middle of it right now. Um, and, and, they're said that it's, it's still picking up. Mm-hmm. But they're interested, but there's a cool twist of what they've done with the antagonist. So I'm, I'm interested to see what, yeah. what their thoughts on it are going forward. And talking about how the original one was picked up before the book even came out. Yeah, you'd think 
oh, Spielberg, oh, it's something he liked. But again, <laughs> talking about Jaws all over again, but you're 70 years old. He's like, I don't know. Klein said, I don't know if Spielberg would do it again. Like we said, it's like it's the third hardest film he's ever made. It was the hardest film since Saving Private Ryan. It took all this work well, to get. It took I, years. I think it's years. a really interesting one. OK, Spielberg likes to talk about the relationship you have to your creation. And he's over time has been trying to you know work out, especially where he stands in those relationships at that time. Well, he's on the back end of his career now. You know, if, he gets to kind of put himself in place of the uh, patriarch here of the uh, right. of the corporation. It's very interesting. That he decides to do this movie because it seems to take that on. You'd have to be too honest with yourself mm -hmm. about where you are in your life. Yeah. Um, and well, relating we, that directly to that material. I mean, you're saying that the, the director of the film feels like the lost, forgotten, minimized creator that really just has fun engaging in the things that make them light up. Yeah. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> With the mocap suits. Yeah. <laughs> so that'll be interesting to see because the next thing he's slated to do, obviously he's got a million things in the fire, you know, but the thing that definitely is being made and has been worked on and was supposed to come out, I think this month and was pushed to 2021 is West Side Story, the musical. Oh, yes. So yes. I have no idea how that relates to Steven Spielberg and his personal journey, but it'll be interesting to see right. how does he... What what drew you know he he's so selective what right why did he pick I think he's also right. just trying to do things that are hard like a musical a classic exactly. musical that, exactly you know, I think that not? has everything to do with it yeah I think he's done everything and he you know, I think I think what, what I was saying if you look at these other movies he's done over the last you know decade or two and looking at them one on their own I don't know what they say but if you look at them well I think he's playing with stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think and I think West Side Story is about playing with a genre that maybe he's always been too timid to really jump into. Well, what? who cares? Mm -hmm. Why not? Let's do it. OK. Yeah. yeah. So let's get um, into some of the some of the legacy stuff. Like you said, what he's playing around with, where he has put his energy over the years, even outside of this stuff. Super into video games, which was surprising to me. DreamWorks Interactive was a video game arm of DreamWorks in the 1990s, and he created Medal of Honor, the game series by EA. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Because I was like, oh, they copied <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. And it's like, no, okay. no, no, Steven Spielberg was the story, yeah. right? Like he wrote the stories for that. So movie. if you didn't believe us about Saving Private Ryan's visuals <laughs> permanently altering the zeitgeist of, you know, war media. Yeah. Uh, it goes further than just even just that. It's a yes, it is Steven Spielberg wholesale. <laughs> he, and he, he, he owns all the most recent consoles. I thought it was funny in an interview I read. He criticizes cutscenes in video games. He doesn't like <laughs> them. He's like, that's the challenge of video games. How do you make the story flow naturally in with the gameplay? That's the exciting challenge mm -hmm. for the developers. It's just you'd think. He'd want more of that. <laughs> Gosh, but that's not why he like he. You know, he knows the medium. We had mentioned earlier that he dropped out of Cal State in right. Long Beach. He went back and got his bachelor's in film in 2002 when he was 56 oh years old. Oh my god! Because he was like, "You got to complete your education." It took me <laughs> dozens of more years, but I still got it done. You know, like did that professor over there, like what? Okay, <laughs> I guess, uh, take this test on this. Yeah, it's like a uh, Spielberg. Uh, We're teaching uh, you. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> We're using your movies as uh, lessons here. You can't just turn in Schindler's List every assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he but he did it. Um, so let's get to the the meat of the whole thing. How does he do this? How does How in the he, world? Every single time we see, <laughs> How does he do? he's got uh, at least a film a year or two or every other. I mean, it's just, and he's, we also forgot to mention, he has, more than ever. he has DreamWorks and Amblin Entertainment. He produced every other thing that, you know, Shrek, Men in Black, Transformers, you know, like. He's produced uh, stuff he's never even read. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's done he it all. He doesn't have time to read it. How does he do it all? And, and the thing <laughs> that I yeah. think from looking at all of this, obviously, immense talent from the beginning. Joan Crawford said it when he was 21 on the first set. Right. Beyond that, though, we talk about him all the time. It's a village. Like, all of these people that it takes to make films, like you said, yeah. he is the emotional resonance, but he's also the leader behind it all. And I think the big thing is 
perpetually working with the same people over and over and over again, the collaborator yes. that he has. So Janusz Kaminski is the cinematographer since Schindler's List, 1993. He's done everything up to wow. Ready Player One. He's done. He's been the cinematographer oh behind the camera. And then Michael Kahn has been the editor since Close Encounters. From 1977, wow. he's had the same yeah. editor that he's worked with. Rick Carter has been the production designer since Jurassic Park for at least 10 of the films after that. He's been the production designer for. So Jesus. it's just like consistently these people over and over again that he's working with. And I'm sure, God, since 77, you've been working with the same guy for 40 years. Like you better have a shared yeah, <laughs> language. A rapport. No. And, <laughs> and that's also how he's able to, it's like, how can he be a working on sign language? Yeah. How can he be working on three things at once? Well, he knows that person and knows what to say and trusts and can, and can build a, yeah. A workflow. He is a business. He is a machine when it comes. That's where you have to boil it down. Just like what are the th what are the things that only Stephen can do, and that's those are the things that he has to do. Which is like, okay, I've got to read this. <laughs> right. I've got to storyboard this. Okay, I need I'll to let read this, this person novel. do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's like you do that. A yes on that. I like it in green. <laughs> you know, it's just like in the, like you have, it's a, like a process of we of weeding out mm -hmm. the things that you can hand off to the people that you trust that you have a rapport with. That you go, okay, I'm thinking this, but here, what what do you make of that go? Um, and then they come back and they go and then they present some options. But it's like he's he he has a working rapport with people that he just trusts, and there's nothing more valuable than that. And then lastly, I think tying back into that rapport and familiarity, working on adaptations. He is, as we see, the master of adaptations. And it's because not only does he pull from other things, but he pulls from not just the material, but other films, even himself. So like you said, Jaws is a reworking of his first film, Duel. Close Encounter yes. and Hook is pulling from Disney's stuff. War of the Worlds is a different interpretation of Close Encounters. Raiders of the Lost Ark is talking from the 1940s serialized films. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tintin is based on every other Tintin film tried to do. He changed how it was doing. You know, right. he, he's adapted what we might call airport novels like Jaws and Jurassic Park. He's also done literary fiction, The Color Purple. He did short stories. He did comic books. He did children's books, autobiographies, nonfiction, you know, all Gosh. everything he's building on either himself, something he's already done or um, an array of different uh, different materials, different types of literary works. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's like where you can say, oh, how is he able to do all this? Because he's pulling from everything, all the people he works with and all the material that exists out there. It takes all that stuff and you can really get you can really get somewhere. And this is somebody that just I think he is I think for people who don't study film and don't, you know, look at this stuff the way that that we do, I think he, you know, he's just some sort of mad magician. It's like <laughs> I think I think no. I think he is more like the guy in Ready Player One, who's kind of more nervous and small and just likes to tinker with the things that he really enjoys. And he's got some real, you know, deep rooted questions and thoughts and feelings about the people that he loves, like we all do. Yeah. And he knows how to get people to <laughs> play his music and act in his stuff and yeah. put up his mom puts up the marquee on the on the thing and exactly. sells the tickets and makes a dollar. Making them part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It takes a village. My God. Well, amazing. That is it. That is it. <laughs> Our Steven Spielberg series is complete. There's yeah. so we skipped over so many things, but uh, again, and, and and like I said, you know, like it's somewhere down the line, the next Jurassic Park movie will come out, and we'll take that as an opportunity to go back and look at at the first two, and maybe reopen the innards of that more, and the, the other other movies as they become relevant, things he does, he's done, or come back around, or are remade, or he does more things. So that's not the end of Steven Spielberg, but. This was really great. I'm really, I'm really, really thankful for you guys coming along on this journey. Well, as always, if you have any suggestions, comments, critiques, curse words, send us a message at, <laughs> <We didn't> <laughs> at Illiterate Pod on Instagram. And uh, thank you all. We'll catch you next week. Yeah.